Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. Yes. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Can everyone hear me when I'm speaking at this volume? Yes. Very good. Whenever the bishop uh, is about to finish putting on the glorious vestments of the Lord Jesus Christ, because the bishop stands as a material sacrament, or as a material presence of the High Priest Jesus Christ Himself in earthly form. So we are walking icons of the Lord. And that's why we disappear so that Christ can appear. While well, we're in the background so He can be in the foreground. That's why we put these glorious vestments on. Because we are now the glorified Christ coming from heaven to earth. You notice that when I had my black on and I had a wooden staff, it was Jesus who saved the world through his humility by dying on the cross and rising again. But when I come from the solia, the altar, it's Christ coming from heaven to earth. And so the wooden staff is changed to a golden scepter. The black clothes, which represent darkness and shadows of death, are changed to the bright colors of the glory of heaven. So I thought I would tell you now. <laughs> but that's not the sermon. <laughs> but, see, this, this is part of the sermon. When the priest put, when the bishop puts the vestments on, he puts the cross on first, and he kisses the cross, and he says, Whoever would come after me, let him deny himself and take upon his cross. For whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. And that was the Gospel reading that we read today at St. Mark's Gospel. That every time the priest puts that on, the bishop puts it on, he loses his life. And not... Not the life God gave him, but the life that he would like to lead. So this is the life Christ has given me to lead for him. And then I put the, all of the last piece of vestment, the omophorion, which is Jesus taking on the humanity of Christ. All the burden of the sins of the world are laid on the cross beam of the cross. And if I were to spread this out, would be the cross beam of the cross. Now it's around me, and I'm stronger than the wood. <laughs> See, I'm stronger than the cross. I stand now in place, and on the throne of God is the cross beam. Can you still hear me? Am I talking too soft? Can you still hear me? So this is so important. It reminds us that whenever we are baptized and chrismated in the church, then our life is given to Christ. We give it to Him. And that's why we say we lose our life for Christ. The loss is not, we don't lose our identity, we use our energy. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? We don't lose our identity, we use our energy to serve Christ. Because we wouldn't have it anyway. I mean, we can't take it to ourselves. Because God gave it to us. What we do is give it back to Him in the service of Him. So when the bishop puts and says, whoever would lose his life for my sake will save it, it reminds us that all of us have to do that. We have to put on the vestments of Jesus in the way we live, in the circumstances and conditions that God has given us, whatever they are, in that, in that picture frame, so to speak. Maybe I could say that. In every one of our lives is a frame. And how we paint the picture of our life is by serving God and others. And so by serving God and others are the pigments to the painting of our portrait. 
<laughs> to the pigments of our painting, to our own personal portrait, where we draw Christ in our lives. And of course, behind it is the cross we bear. Whatever struggles we have, whatever challenges we're given, that's what we have to carry. And then notice then, when we start carrying the cross, just like when the bishop carries the wooden humility, after a while it becomes golden. So it's not, in Orthodox we don't look at a cross as merely a, a, a means by which Jesus suffered terribly in agony and was a victim, because by this he became champion. He's not the innocent victim only, although he is, but he's the victorious Lord primarily, which he won in the arena where he beat the adversary spirit and death. And that's the greatness of the cross. It's the sword of victory. Well, you know that. Father, I'm sure Father Ben preaches that real well. But I wanted to emphasize all these things so far for me. So let me then say again, we have to lose our life, we have to use our energy in the service of God, whatever it is, and then we get more energy. The more we use it for Christ, the more He gives it back to us. I don't have my cell phone with me today, because I'm concentrating on the timelessness of God. By the way, Whenever a priest or bishop serves, they take off all timepieces on them. Did you know that? Take off your watch, turn that phone off anywhere you have what, because we're no longer in this world's time. Did you ever think of that? We're no longer in this world's time. That's why whenever the bishop says, you know, be with you, and he says, blessed is the kingdom, that's the eternal kingdom of God that's with us now. There's no time left. That's why I take the watch off. But anyway, to get back to that, when you plug your phone in, you have to re-get it more battery power. That's what you do. The more you use it, the more God gives you power to keep using yourself in His service. So that's the first thing I wanted to say about this beautiful feast of next thing I want to explain is the cross itself. There are two words in Greek for redemption or atonement. One is litro, and that means to buy someone out of trouble, to pay a debt. So when, and this had to do in the Greek world with slaves. So if I wanted to buy someone out of slavery or redeem them, I had to pay a price to do it. So I bought them out of captivity. I bought them out of captivity and brought them out of captivity by paying the price. So that's one meaning. And the other meaning is agorazo. It's a it, it, it means to buy back from the marketplace. Not to buy back, but to buy for. So Jesus bought us for himself. And that is the redemption too. He redeemed us, or he bought us. Like you would go for a consumer good. You would buy it in the marketplace. So he bought it for Christ. So therefore he brought us out of captivity to sin and death by the cross, redemption, and he brought us to himself by buying us to him, binding us to him, by purchasing us and paying the price of the purchase, which was to die our death so that we could, he could live our life. That's a great thing. So he, he bought us from captivity and for himself. Can you see that again? He bought us, brought, bought us from captivity, sin, sickness, suffering, and death. And then he bought us for himself. Two meanings. And 
That's why we have to live for him. Our life has already been given to him because he purchased us. We can't, now let me be clear, we can't really live just for ourselves anymore because we've been bought. Do you not know that you have been bought with a price, Jesus said? You are not your own. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. But that's a freedom for us. All we need to serve Christ. We don't need to serve ourselves even. Because if we're serving ourselves, we change what we want all the time. Did you ever think of that? Every day, we have new desires. Every moment, we like to change our lives. We have a hard time keeping up with ourselves. Don't you find that? Sometimes we make ourselves tired just by all the things we want. Isn't that true? You ever think of that? You end up the day you're tired. You know what? Other people didn't make us tired. We made ourselves tired because we were all over the place thinking we were going to find happiness and duties and all these other things. But now we're liberated to serve Christ and to serve Him only. And that gives us back our happiness in life. And then I'm going to say something else because I don't know if I'm going to be back here next year at St. Michael the Archangel Church. So I'll give you an extra long sermon. <laughs> extra long. I was thinking about this as we go into Holy Week. And how much Jesus saved, said, loved the people in every way. He fed them, he healed them, he spoke with them, he counseled them, he encouraged them, he gave them confidence so much so that the guards wouldn't even arrest him. No man spoke like this man. And they didn't even follow orders. They were mesmerized by this wonderful divine person who was also a human person, a human being. You know? Well, didn't they welcome him on Palm Sunday? He was on a white horse or a white donkey. Everybody put, we're going to put palms, branches, all those things. The crowd loved him on that day. But only five days later, they were saying, crucify him. Same, same crowds. Same crowds. Just an amazing thing. How you can change. Five days, that's what happens when you serve yourselves and not Christ. Change. There's one more great meaning in that. What if Jesus listened to the crowds when the Pharisees said and the high priest said, if you are the Son of God, Come down from that cross, and we will worship you. If you think Palm Sunday was a big, popular day with the people, imagine if Jesus came down from that cross, healed his wounds like he healed everybody else, and walked among them. That would have been even a bigger crowd-pleasing day than Palm Sunday. But if he did, he wouldn't have destroyed death through that cross. He wouldn't have given us a chance for eternal life. He would have just made the crowds happy. And he would have been a miracle in history only. This lesson is, it's better to do what God wants us to do. No matter what the crowds say, no matter what popularity we might have, the only thing that really counts is serving God first. If we make God happy, we will be happy, even if we're on a cross. That's how we gain our life, by making God happy. The crowds will come and go, but the crown remains. If the rest.
Augustine.